Thank you for joining us today. A common question we get is which one should I choose because we do have a few different models of Flowhive now if you have a look on our website. So what we're going to do today is just go over the different features, the different wood types and the different sizes and that's basically the choices you're making are uh, what wood you'd like or, or what features you'd like and also the, the sizing choice. So starting with the wood, and if you do have any questions put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering them at the end. So starting with the wood, you've got the three different wood types here that we offer. The Western Red Cedar is by far our popular uh, wood choice and that's really popular in North America uh, as, and it's well known as probably the, the, uh, the best wood you can possibly get because of its lightweight and its 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 mold resistant properties. It's uh, just very um, hardy, but it's very light as well. And not only that, it just looks fantastic. So if you are going to oil your hive like this and keep it looking like this fresh oiled wood color, then cedar is definitely the choice that you want to make. Now, keeping wood outdoors looking like that freshly oiled wood is quite a challenge because you're really going against what nature wants to do. It wants to slowly turn it back into the earth. But if you want to keep it looking like that, the cedar is definitely the best wood choice for that. And if, um, if you give it a bit of a rub with, with a little sandpaper and a bit more oil every 6 or 12 months, then you can keep it looking quite nice. The, the next wood type we have here is the is the Aracaria. It also gets called hoop pine here in Australia, but it's not really a pine at all. It's it's quite a dense wood. It's a it's a cabinet timber. Some fine furniture and windows and doors get made from this here in Australia. So fine joiners often like this hoop pine wood, and we're laser cutting all of these hives here in Australia. Um, it's not as mildew resistant, better painted. So if you're choosing this wood, better to paint it. It's sustainably grown here in Queensland, just up the road from us. And best to, to paint that wood if you, to get a really long lasting finish. If you just swing the, the camera around here, you'll see there's a couple of painted hive examples at the end where you can see the beautiful paint jobs you can do and you can let your creativity loose and get your family on board and have fun painting your hives or you can just paint it white like a traditional bee box. And uh, then you've got this wood type here which is a new one we've, we've got um, and that's the polonia which is very um, lightweight sustainably grown. It grows to harvest in about five years which is quite a, a short space of time so it's a bit of an icon of sustainability is the polonia wood. It doesn't handle, um, it also needs painting, it doesn't, it, it won't stay looking like that outdoors if you just oil it. So painting it again is the way to go if you're using the polonia. A good outdoor, an outdoor house paint is what you need for a really long lasting finish. I tend to paint it on the outside because um, I like to leave the inside just perfectly natural for the bees but that's a personal choice. Lots of conventional beekeepers will paint the insides of their boxes and dip their boxes in chemicals and all sorts of things to get longer lasting qualities of their bee boxes so it doesn't matter the bees will be okay either way but I tend to just paint the outside. So that's the um, three wood choices. You've got polonia, Aracaria and Western Red Cedar. Western Red Cedar being by far the most um, popular because of its beauty. It really does look good in your garden. The next choice you'll be faced with making is what size you want your hive to be. So there's a couple of different sizes of the of hives in the world in the Langstroth. There's what's called the 8 frame Langstroth or 10 frame Langstroth. And what that means is if you, if you grab a box of regular frames, this size fits 8 Langstroth 
frames in it like that. If you go to the next size up, it fits 10, so two more brood frames you get in your brood box. Now we've come along and confused things a little bit because when bees are making honey, they like to make deeper cells. So what we've done is made our flow frame invention a bit wider than brood frames. And you can see that here. So instead of being eight, there's six in a box. So that gets called the flow hive six. Now, if you want the, um, the wider one, then it fits seven flow frames, so that gets called the flow frame, flow hive seven. So the difference is one more flow frame of honey or two more uh, brood frames in your box. Now the reason why you choose one or the other is, there's a few reasons for that. One is you might be in a colder climate where you're really wanting to maximise the amount of honey storage for that long cold winter ahead. Now it, they also get to store a bit more honey in the edges of their brood box which can act a little bit like a, a like um, it's a kind of a heat sink, it's, it's thermal mass is it, to help insulate the um, brood nest in the middle when they put honey on the outside. So generally if you go right up into the north of North America they will be using the larger size more commonly. If you go into to Europe they also like to use larger size boxes and sometimes it's just a case of the beekeeper if you've already got a certain size you might like to stick with that because you can match the equipment together uh, more easily than if they're different size boxes. Usually a personal preference for a beekeeper so you can do your research you can ask locals what they do it's getting more popular that the eight frame Langstroth or Flow Hive 6 sizing just because it's a bit lighter and easier to move around and take the boxes off and so on. If, uh, but of course you ask beekeepers and you, you ask three beekeepers you'll get five answers. So, so um, a, a nice example is I was travelling around Tasmania which is the most southern uh, state in Australia here and one commercial beekeeper said if you don't have double brood 10 frame boxes your bees will die and um, I went oh, okay that's interesting that's how you do it here and then I went around the corner another commercial operator and he said oh no I just use the, the eight frames the single brood is fine so there you've got two very different opinions in a really cold region so it does depend in the end on what you want to do so you can do your research and find out for yourself um, which way you want to go. This is the most popular which is the Flow Hive 6 frame and we mostly have that in the world. So the next thing to discuss is the features. Now starting from the other side here, the left side, we've got what we call the Flow Hive Classics and then we move into the Flow Hive 2 here. So we started off with the Flow Hive Classic and we don't have the very original model right here today, but it, it looked more or less like this, but without the laser cuts, and it was a Western Red Cedar model made in the USA. And the features of that are, you've got a screened bottom board and a core flute slider here to adjust your ventilation. So you've got a couple of, of slots there to, that's ventilated and that is not. Oh, you can also use this sheet for counting Varroa mites. Now on the edge of the hive we have one window for you to, to look in at your bees and how they're filling those flow frames. On the rear we have the, the rear window which you can look in at the cross section of your flow frames and I'll show you that more in a minute. The baseboard is built with a three degree slope for your honey harvesting angle and the front of the baseboard we've sloped away so water is less likely to run into the entrance of the hive. So it has our six flow frames allowing the honey 
on tap, our, our invention in here in your honey box. And then in the bottom is your brood frames that we showed you earlier. Basically a conventional Langstroth frame. We like to promote naturally drawn comb just for putting the comb guide in the top and letting the bees do it themselves. But you can also put wax and wire in here, which is more conventional, or even a plastic foundation sheet if you wish. Starting over here, there's various different levels of flow frames. So this is a what we call a three. So we have three frames in the center of what we call our hybrid. Then these uh, traditional frames on the edge for you to collect some honey comb from. So that's why we call it the hybrid because you've got honeycomb on the edges and flow hive in the middle. So it's kind of a mix. So if you want to dabble in the flow hives, you're not quite sure, you still want to have some of these conventional frames in the top box, you can. Of course you've got these in the bottom as well. So so um, the hybrid is there. It's a little bit of a taster. It's also got a lower price point so that some people like to start with the hybrid. We thought it would be quite popular because you, you know, best of both worlds in a way, but by far people prefer the full rack of flow frames like this one at the end here. So that's um, the most popular, it's just to have our flow frames in the top for you to harvest honey from when you see it's nice and full here, you can see the bees capping it off down the edges, you can then harvest into your honey jars. You get about about um, six to eight of these jars per frame. So so you have over 40 if you harvested all of these frames. So there's plenty of honey in the frames. It's amazing to watch it come out. And if you haven't seen that, then tune in again um, in, in next week or the week after, and we'll give you a demonstration live of harvesting the honey from the frames. A bit of a wet day today, so we're here on the veranda just looking at the hives and which one will be most suitable to choose in your area, in your climate, and the features you'd like. So you've got the three flow frames in the middle. We also have a model with four flow frames in the middle, which matches the 10 frame Langstroth size. The three frames here matches the eight frame Langstroth size. So there was a lot of maths we had to do in the beginning to work out our sizing for everything. Um, and then we went, took the feedback from all of our customers from all over the world. We've got uh, over 70,000 now in 130 different countries. And we said, let's build in some features to, to really respond to that feedback. So that was the Flow Hive 2. And here it is, and I'll run through the features now. So starting from the base going up, you can see we've put these legs on it. Now, they're adjustable. You can simply just lift the hive a bit and spin this foot and adjust the level of your hive, which saves that getting out there with the shovel and, and trying to get a really level site to put your hive on. So we thought, why not just make the hive adapt to the terrain? And you can do that on each corner of the hive just by spinning these feet and leveling up your hive. So to help you, we put the levels in the side here and around on the other side as well. So that's not quite level. We'll, we'll adjust the feet on this side just to bring that to nice and level in the sideways direction, which is helpful when you're when you're when the bees are drawing natural comb because you don't want the comb to if if the hive isn't level to to drift sideways onto the next frame or you've got a big mess that's hard to clean up. So if it's nice and level, hanging nice and level, then the comb should go downwards and that's the reason why we put that level in the in the back vented cover here. This, the level on the side also helps you get it right for your honey harvesting angle. So when the bubble's in the middle, then you're good to go for harvesting your honey. You've got a nice, nice three degree slope approximately back towards the rear of the hive so the honey will drain out. If you don't do that, then you could risk spilling a lot of honey inside your hive. So that's important. That's why we put that level there. We then, uh, we've got this um, leg kit here 
the integrated hive stand built into the baseboard, which was quite unusual. It, that wasn't something beekeepers were doing. We decided to do that, so it's it's um, more seamless. You can just put these legs on, and away you go, without having to build another stand under your hive, if you like. The screen bottom board, we we improved from being a mesh. We did have issues in the beginning where bees were getting through some of the mesh, which which wasn't um, uh, tight enough, or the QC wasn't good enough on that mesh. So what we've done is we've cre created a, a solid aluminium mesh now that's been laser cut with um, with the uh, gaps in it that the bees can't get through, but the hive beetles can and the varroa can still drop through. So the purpose of having that mesh is so that hive beetles and varroa can fall through and I'll show you about how that works now. So if you take out this vented cover then we have a tray in here. So this is, uh, has got quite a few functions and one is you can put oil in there to catch those hive beetles. Works quite well if you're in an area that has lots of hive beetles. You can also use it for, ca for counting varroa mites. You can also run it upside down if you don't want that tray to, uh, to, to fill up with uh, water if it rains hard and there's a lot of rain blowing into the entrance of the hive. It's not a big issue, the water can go down through the screen and into there, but it can get, um, depending on how often you're checking, if you don't like to pull out this tray very often, you can just run it up the other way. If you're using it to catch beetles, then this is the way you want to run it. You could also leave it completely out, which gives you a lot of ventilation. If you're in a really hot time, that could be a good thing to do because that air movement can just flow straight in, up under the screen and into the hive. If you're um, wanting to just have uh, a bit of ventilation, it's the, it's the summertime and put the vents up and that air can flow through these up above your tray. We've also designed it so you can turn it up the other way so that the air then can't get in and it's uh, less ventilated. So in the colder times, you spin it up that way. So it's got a few, few choices there for ventilation for your bees as well that you can experiment with. Then moving up to the brood box, we decided to make these nice harvesting shelves that um, can click on to the hive, so that's a nice feature you can get to dual purpose this this uh, rear um, access window and use it as your shelf like that. Works quite nicely and you can put the shelf on in differing positions depending on the height of your jars. So if you've got tall jars you could put your shelf brackets right down low like this and put big tall jars that can, can actually um, take the volume of a whole frame. We've got quite a few questions coming in, which is good, so keep putting your questions in the comments below. And as far as the, the super goes, we've added another window on the side, which I find it's, it, the more views into your world of bees, the better, because you can really start to get an idea of how your bees are going, the numbers of your bees. You can see the numbers dropping and go, well, my hive's in trouble, I better make sure I get into the brood nest, make sure they've still got a laying queen, and that kind of thing. It's very helpful. You can also look down between the frames here to see the numbers of bees in your hive as well. You can also watch the bees do their amazing thing of putting nectar into the cells, either in the side window or the rear window, and then watch them cap it off with their wax when they've got that moisture content of the honey below 20%. And then the roof, we've designed it so that this comes in one piece for, for better weather protection. We still recommend painting the roof. This one's oiled. It's a, a display hive, but we recommend putting paint on all of these roofs. Get it all into the cracks. Use a, a good outdoor paint that will create a good weather seal. So um, that's, that's most of the new features on the Flow Hive 2. So it's basically um, you're looking at features, you're looking at wood type and you're looking at size. If you're unsure, the most popular choice is this one, which is our Flow Hive 6 Western Red Cedar. Some questions coming in, so we'll get to answering them.
Cassie's asking, which one do you think would do well in central Florida where it's warm, humid and heavy random rains? Painting uh, is not an issue if it need be done. Okay, so the Flow Hive 2 has more features and with any of them if you put a lot of good paint on top and make sure you're sealing the craps, cracks, then you can, um, you can get a good weather seal on top. Some people like to, in the heavy rainfall areas, use a bit of silicon on the inside of their roof as well, just to, to get a good weather seal. Um, also, if you're in a, a, a lot of heavy rain area, sometimes it's nice to actually put your hives under shelter, depending on on where you are in the world and what kind of um, what, what kind of access you've got. Like some people keep their hives on their balconies and uh, verandas under under the the um, cover of a carport etc. Um, your bees are, are very adaptable and they will um, do, a, do a good job of keeping the climate inside the hive at the required temperature for their brood nest whether they're out in the baking hot sun or, or in, the, in the snow. So incredibly resourceful bees are. It's amazing, amazing that they can be in such varied parts of the world really the, the same bees. Um, so in terms of where you are, um, you, could, you could choose any of these hives because it's a, um, a, a more temperate climate, then you don't necessarily need to go to that larger size box for the honey stores for the winter. You'll find your season will probably be longer. Talk to your local beekeepers. Here we're in a subtropical region and we get honey in dribs and drabs all year round. Sometimes we get a good winter flow, sometimes not. But generally, there's flowers around. So we can keep hives just looking like this. Some people like to add another box, another honey super or another brood box. Um, others tend to just keep them like this. If you've got a single brood box and a single honey super like this, then your bees will build up and be ready to split and make another colony sooner. If you um, add more boxes, then you might find they they might be they might not need splitting for for a couple of years, depending on your strategies. There. Mark has a cedar flow hive and is asking: Can you leave the roof oiled, or does it have to be painted with an exterior paint? We recommend painting just at least the rooftop with an exterior paint, just to really um, seal it well because that's what cops the most of the weather and you want to create a good weather seal. Having said that, you can experiment. Um, I do have hives with no uh, paint on top. It will go quite um, weather, weather worn quite quickly, the top. It'll get a lot of particles fall on it and it'll go kind of a, a, a grey colour quite quickly. So that's another factor. If you're after the aesthetic, it won't stay looking like that on the top of your hive. So Harland is asking which bee box is suitable in Borneo, and Stephanie is asking what about in Alabama? Okay, Borneo. That's amazing. So Borneo, you're in a um, in a tropical region, and you could use. Uh, there's no reason to go to to the bigger size, although you can if you want to. So any of these would be suitable. And that's the thing, all, all of our flow hives are actually suitable for everywhere. There's just at those minute choices, really, of do you want to go a little bit bigger, a bit more honey in those colder times, perhaps they store a bit more and uh, a little bit more, um, they have a bit more food to survive a really long, cold winter. Or it might be that you're just matching to the equipment. So you could definitely choose any of these in Borneo. Alabama, um, now it's it's up to you. I think you need to, to find out from your local beekeepers on how long and cold the winters are and um, if they are and what size is currently used around you. Sometimes it's helpful just to, to uh, use the size that's more available in your area um, and it's more of just matching in with the local beekeepers, so you're, you're doing something that's not, um, I guess, too odd for
for, for the area. Lots of people have strong opinions about beekeeping, as you'll find out if, you, if you're on the start of this journey. And um, the size of the hive is one of the opinions people do have. Wilson has two traditional 10 frame hives. What size will he need to, to have the flow hive work with his current hives? Okay, so the 10 frame size hive is this one here. So this is the bigger one and that's got 10 brood frames. If you count all the brood frames in the bottom box here, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 right across there. So this is the match for it. We call it the flow hive 7 because the 7 flow frames in the top. Flow frames have a deeper honey cell because bees like to store, when they're, when they're just doing honey, not brood, they like to use a deeper cell. And if you really tune in to what the bees do, if you look at the random cove, comb under the roof, you'll see a lot of deeper, larger cells for storing honey than you will in the brood nest. So for that reason, there's a different number of frames in the top. It gets a little bit confusing because we call it the flow hive seven, but it's actually will match your 10 frame Langstroth, more or less. There is varying uh, box sizes around the world, and but it'll be close enough to put on top if you just want to get the, the this part of it and put it onto your, your conventional hive, you can do that. If you want to do a full swap out, you can get the, the whole thing and then just swap the brood from your, your current conventional Langstroth hive into the bottom box here and away you go. The bees will go from there and start to wax up all of the flow frames and if you've got a good nectar flow, you start to enjoy watching them really fill up the flow frames. Luke says, with the predicted weather event on the east coast of Australia, where we will be experiencing very high winds, would you recommend strapping down the hives? If so, how and where is best? Okay, great. That's another feature that I missed when we were going through the new improved features of the Flow Hive 2. And one of them is there's some roof locks here. If, if you come and have a look at this, we've just got a little wing nut you can basically do up to lock your roof to your hive. Now, the roof is really the thing that will blow off in high winds. So, uh, and because the bees aren't necessarily up there, you might have left the, the plug in. That's another feature that we added, was a plug in here so that you can, you can decide whether you want the bees to get into the roof cavity or not. If there's no bees in the roof cavity, they won't have glued the roof down, in which case these fasteners on the edge will help you keep your roof on top of your hive in those high winds. If you have our Flow Hive Classic, it doesn't have that feature and you may need to tie your roof down in strong winds. We find here, if you point the camera this way, we've got strong winds that come up this slope here. They come roaring up the hill and when the winds get to about 80 kilometres an hour, the Flow Hive, that's a very strong wind by the way, the, um, the Flow Hive Classic roofs can, can get blown off. So if we've got winds like that, we do tend to put a strap around the Flow Hive Classics or, or you could put some bricks on top or whatever you like. Uh, the Flow Hive too, you just tighten up those wing screws. Now in terms of the rest of the hive, if it's established then it's unlikely to get blown over because you've got a lot of weight in the hive and the bees propolize the hive together. So you don't tend to need to strap it so much but if you're just establishing your hive and there's not that weight and that the bees haven't glued it all together you can get a little bit of drift um, happening in the strong wind so if you've just put the super on then by all means strap it down if you're unsure then strap it down and uh, keep your hive safe you certainly don't want it blowing apart in the rain because the bees um, unless you're in a really warm climate could really suffer from getting wet and cold and you could lose a lot of your bees or they could abscond um, if your hive does come apart in those cyclonic conditions. We've got Stephanie, time for a couple more questions. Oh, we've got so many today. Um, Stephanie's asking, do the bees still make comb in the flow hives for beeswax? Yes, they do. So in the bottom box, if you have a look here, it's like any conventional hive 
The only difference is we're supplying this comb guide here for the bees to do their perfectly uh, natural wax comb from. So that means you've got no wax, no wires, and it's really easy to cut out that comb if you want to. In fact, you can go with an oven tray to your hive, take a frame out of your brood box, cut that comb out. Usually the frames on either side are just um, honey. So they've got wax and honey in them, no brood. So if you see that, you could take one of them out, cut that comb out, and just put it straight back in for them to fill up again. If you've got wax and wire, then it's a bit more of a pain. You actually have to cut, take the frame out, have a replacement one, put it in, take it into the kitchen, take, cut out the sections between the wires, then put your foundation sheet back in again after cleaning it all up and then put it back in. Um, so there's an advantage to going naturally drawn comb. If you're interested in that, then we've got some more videos about naturally drawn comb as well and um, some quite in-depth knowledge from various different experts around the world in our, in our um, new thebeekeeper.org um, course if, you're, if you want to really sink your teeth into, into some really in-depth information to help you get started in beekeeping. Um, so yes, wax comb down the bottom. Some people use plastic foundation down the bottom which you wouldn't be able to really cut that out and use it as honeycomb but um, if you do want to get in there you can pull out some comb and take it to the next party. The other thing you can do is leave the plug out in the roof and they'll build some random natural comb in the roof cavity which you can then cut out and enjoy chewing on that honeycomb as well. Another thing you could do is get the hybrid which is a mix of these conventional Langstroth frames that you can use for honeycomb to of these on either side and then the three flow frames in the middle or the four flow frames in the middle depending on which model you're going for. Time for one more question. Tracy has a hybrid hive and says the bees have started making comb on the glass viewing window. Should we remove that comb off the window or leave it in place? Okay that's up to you. It, it doesn't affect the performance of your hive. What it does affect is when you go to inspect or pull out those frames. So if I was you, I'd just leave it there until the time when you want to remove those frames. And in that case, you'd be running your hive tool down the viewing window. So you'd have the roof off at that point. You'd be in your bee suit. You'd be using your smoker. And you'd be sliding your hive tool down the viewing window and uh, just cutting that comb before you could actually pull the frame out. Sometimes they go wonky in naturally drawn comb. They're more likely to build wonky comb in the top box. So in a hybrid, it may pay to put a foundation sheet um, either side or bring up a nice straight one from the bottom box to put on the edge when it's time to put your super on your hive. Thanks very much for tuning in. I know there's lots of questions. We'll get to answering them online now in text. And tune in again next week if you've got something you'd like us to cover, then we're here to answer all your questions and help you get started in the amazing world of beekeeping. No such thing as a silly question. Same time next week and we'll be going through something interesting. So let us know what you'd like us to cover.